Hello and welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my absolute pleasure to welcome you to today's session. Today's webinar regarding gender and finances is hosted by the MFLN Personal Finance Concentration Area. For those of you who have joined us before, you may notice that our platform is a little bit different today, so I'd like to give you a brief tour so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're able to view the slides that we're currently sharing. If you're unable to see them or are having any other difficulties, please email us at millfamln at gmail.com for tech support. Also note down this email should you need to contact us at some point during today's webinar as well. As usual, we look forward to having you join us in the chat pod for conversation and questions. Thank you so much to everyone who's taken the time to say hello. Um, let us know where you're joining us from. Looks like we've got quite the global group today. To embed the chat pod so you don't miss any links or conversations, simply place your cursor over the shared slide. You'll then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen. And from there, you'll just need to click the chat bubble icon to bring that up and process. Uh, to the right hand side of your screen. When typing your comments or questions, please do be sure to send the send to all panelists and attendees so that everyone is able to view them in the chat pod. We'll be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. I'll now turn things over to my colleague Molly Herndon, who's the programming coordinator for the MFLN personal finance team to introduce today's presenters. Molly. Thank you, Coral. I'm pleased to produce our presenters for today's webinar. Dr. Barbara O'Neill is a financial resource management specialist for Rutgers Cooperative Extension and has been a professor, financial educator, and author for more than 35 years. Dr. Marty Gillen is an associate professor and extension specialist for the Department of Family, Youth, and Community Sciences in the Institute for Food and Agriculture at the University of Florida. Both Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Gillen are part of the Military Families Learning Network Personal Finance Concentration Area, Dr. O'Neill serves as Outreach Coordinator, and Dr. Gillen is our project's pr uh, Principal Investigator. So I will now turn things over to Dr. Gillen. Thank you. Thank you, Molly. So today we're going to be taking a look at gender and finance. So the first part of this webinar, we're going to be looking at what the research tells us about gender and finance. And specifically, you know, some of the things we might want to consider as we're working with different clients in a personal finance role and how that might affect our ability to kind of discuss things with clients and you know what may affect kind of their ability as far as thinking through different decisions as far as like their risk management preference and stuff like that. So the first thing is to you know think about is there really a difference and as you go through this research you'll see some of the differences that do affect gender and financial literacy risk management tolerance you know kind of that thought process when we look at our finances all the way to earnings and looking at that gender gap and what the research does tells us is that this does start early on and in fact the results show that the gender gap in financial literacy and stereotypes are both present at young ages so that's consistent with the notion that stereotypes influence investment into financial literacy among teenagers as well. So when you think about that again, how that affects how you're working with clients, you know, a lot of these are long held beliefs when we look at some of the stereotypical beliefs associated with that. And, you know, lots of folks come to us with those types of beliefs and thinking about, you know, how that affects their financial management decision making as well. So the 2014 teens and personal finance, they showed differences between gender for those teens. And that was conducted by a group within the United States of participants. And when you look at those differences, it does reveal various gender gaps across many different money related topics. So when you look into some of the details, it found that boys are more likely than girls to get an allowance. So in fact, 67% of boys receive an allowance versus 59% of girls. And when you think about that, that gives boys more opportunity to actually manage a budget and to start learning some financial decision making and stuff early on. And then we also found that more teen boys than girls use some sort of budgeting tool, such as you know thinking about like a smartphone app. So again, a lot of these things are affecting 
our youth and then it goes on in to how we view money as an adult and how we interact with it from that angle as well. So just kind of you know laying that foundation that it is a lot of beliefs that are transferred from society, from family, all of that starting at younger ages, but definitely very evident within those teenage years that feeds into the adult years. So some researchers looked to see how financially literate women are, and they looked at three different questions. So this research, and we'll go through a little more of it in the next few slides, but it collected um, information by having participants answer these three questions. So the first two questions measure whether respondents have a basic understanding of interest rates and inflation. And then the third question evaluates knowledge of risk diversification. So kind of a more sophisticated concept that allowed the researchers differentiate respondents across different levels of financial literacy as well. So some of their findings that they found was that both young and old women showed low levels of financial literacy. So it wasn't necessarily an age issue when it looked at women, but more of a gender issue when it looked at it from that standpoint. So women were overall less likely than men to answer correctly and more likely to indicate that they do not know the answer. And then when you look at the gender differences as well, they were present for very basic as well as the more advanced measures of financial literacy. So across all three of the different questions. And then, you know, thinking about does any of that hold up when you start looking at demographic and economic characteristics? I know when I present in person, that's usually one of the first questions I get are, okay, well, what if it's this demographic or what if it's this economic characteristic? You know, does that change things? And what these researchers found was when they controlled for the demographic and economic characteristics, it rarely changed any of the estimates for that gender gap. And in fact, women were still about 14 percentage points less likely to give those correct answers. And then if you kind of get into some of the other things with demographics, the researchers found that married women exhibit lower levels of financial literacy than married men. And that actually holds true across countries. So they did some of this research and compared different countries as well and found that that held through. And then, you know, thinking about gender differences for the respondents who have those marital breakups. So for those who are widowed, divorced, separated, it's still held true when comparing those groups as well. And then specifically, widows showed very low levels of financial literacy across all of the different countries that they looked at. So when you think about, you know, the gender gap, it also holds true for single men and single women. And in particular, they found within the United States that single women display very low levels of financial literacy. So when you look at the differences in personal savings behaviors, other researchers found that those short term and regular saving behaviors were also differed by gender. So these researchers looked at a sample size of a little over 700 people, and they found that women were less likely to save in the short term if they were poor health, although poor health in itself did not significantly affect men saving in the short term, but only specifically to women. And then they also found that low risk tolerance negatively affected the likelihood of women saving in the short term and saving regularly as well. For men, they found each year of education made a man more likely to save in the short term and to save regularly. So it's interesting to kind of tease out some of those demographic characteristics and even kind of a human capital characteristic when you look at education and see how that also affects gender differences from that personal savings behavior. And this one used the um, Survey of Consumer Finances to do their research. When you look at gender differences among financial risk tolerance, so this one used the same survey as the prior one, the Survey of Consumer Finances. And basically they found that there are gender differences in financial risk tolerance, but that the disparity of it does not result from gender in of, of itself. 
so when you look at that, you know, it's widely acknowledged that, and there's lots of kind of agreement and disagreement on the causes and the underlyings of those mechanisms. So when you think back to the first couple slides that I mentioned with the young adults and even the teenagers, again, a lot of that looks at those stereotypical behaviors and you know how that somebody starts to believe that about themselves. You could possibly be seeing some of that feed into this when you look at the financial risk tolerance. So some of that could be kind of that underlying issues that they're talking about within that. But again, you know, just things to be thinking about as we're working with different clients in different settings. And if you see somebody that, you know, is kind of struggling and you know, you're thinking they should be taking a more conservative approach or even, you know, more moderate approach, depending on, you know, what their goal is, if they're closer to retirement or if they're planning kind of at an early point, you know, a lot of this could feed into that and kind of looking at the why they're asking the questions they're asking and kind of the approach they're taking and how they're even approaching those decisions. And when we look at earnings, we definitely do see some gender differences. And we're gonna walk through how you look at the pay gap and different earnings for different occupations and kind of look at how that affects family across the life cycle, especially, you know, thinking about the savings and, you know, raising children and the retirement planning and all of that that feeds into that. So when you look at the pay gap, that is one of the most pressing issues that women face today. And when you look at the um, pay gap, it's generally a comparison of women and men's median earnings. So median earnings are not the typical earnings or the average earnings. So they're looking at the salaries of all women and men. And this is generally you see working full time. And then the median is a number that's in the middle of the group. So we often say that's the typical earnings. And that's basically the person that literally is right in the middle. So half the people earn more and half of the people earn less. So when you think about oftentimes we hear numbers reported in averages. But what we know with the average is if you try to compare that, you could have very high earnings that could pull the average up or very low earnings that could pull that average down. So when you hear any discussions about the pay gap, it's typically going to be presented within that median earnings standpoint. And it could be looked at on a weekly basis or an annual basis. Both are valid ways to compare the earnings. So as far as calculating it, you would calculate first an earnings ratio and then the pay gap. And they're fairly simple calculations. So the earnings ratio would be the women's median earnings divided by the men's median earnings. And in 2016, that was about 80%. So if you think about it from a dollar perspective, for every dollar that a man earned, a woman earned 80 cents. So the pay gap would be the men's median earnings, subtract the women's, and then divide that total by the men's median earnings, and you would get that 20%. So again, for every dollar that the man earns, you would see a woman earning about 80 cents. And I see Rusk is asking about pay gap studied in the military. We're going to be talking about pay in the military in just a little bit. And there's not really that gap as much, but there are some issues when you think about it from a spousal perspective. So we'll get into that in just a little bit in more detail. So when you start to look at the pay gap over time, it's steadily narrowed, but it's nowhere near being eliminated. And in the most recent years, and you can see this evidenced by the little chart that the progress has actually stalled pretty much. So the gap narrowed since 1960, and that was mainly due to women's progress in education and workforce participation, and to men's wages, which were rising at a slower rate. So in 2016, women who were full-time wage and salary workers had median usual weekly earnings, again, about 80% when you look at it as full-time wage workers. And since about 2004, the women's to men's earning ratio has remained about 80 to 83% range. So at the rate of change between 1960 to 2016 data, which was the most recent I could track, 
women are expected to reach pay equity with men in 2059. So if the change continues at a slower rate seen since about 2001, women will not reach pay equity with men until about 2119. So 2119. So basically another 100 years from now. So either way, you're looking at about 40 years. If it continues at the rate that we had saw it before, if it kind of slows down at some of the rates we've seen since 2001, you're looking at about 100 years from now. And when you look at the pay gap in age, so the pay gap is more narrow among younger women and men, but it increases for workers of middle age and older. So for example, in this chart, you can see that among young people ages 16 to 34, so kind of those last three columns on the left, that women are paid close to the same amount that men are paid. In the peak earnings of years 35 to 64, women are paid 74 to 83% of what men are paid. So when you start thinking about the peak earning years and why that's important, you know, that's when a lot of people are doing those 401k plans. And when you think about earnings and all of that, you know, most of that is based on you putting in a certain percentage of your paycheck and hopefully your employer matches a certain percentage. But again, it's based on the dollar amount of what you earn. So you're going to see less of a percentage as far as dollar amount, same percentage, lower dollar amount going in because those earnings would be less looking at it among different genders. And then when you look at the pay gap across race and ethnicity, it affects women from all backgrounds, but it's definitely more varied based on demographics. So this chart shows the pay gap by race and ethnicity among full-time workers in 2016. So you can see that among workers who are Hispanic, Black, American Indian, and Alaskan Native, and Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders, both women and men had lower median earnings than workers who are non-Hispanic white or Asian. And then women were paid less than men within each racial and ethnic group as well. And the pay gaps between men and women within group was smaller among Black, Hispanic, and American Indian and Alaskan Native workers compared to those within group gaps among the white and the Asian workers. So it's really clear from the chart that, you know, it's a smaller gender pay gap among some of these groups, but due solely to the fact that the men in these groups were paid substantially less than the non-Hispanic, white, and Asian men were paid in 2016 as well. So Asian and white women typically were paid more than other women and Asian men were paid the highest wages of any other group. And then when you look at the pay gap in education, we see that while earnings tend to increase with education level, education does not eliminate the pay gap. The pay gap exists at all levels of education and in some cases it's larger at higher levels of education. So, for example, the chart shows that women with less than a high school diploma were paid 77% of what their male peers were paid, and again, this is 2016 data published in 2017, whereas women with advanced degrees were paid only 74% of what men with advanced degrees were made. So, again, far right, 74%, second from the left being 77%. This chart looks at it kind of across different occupations. And there's not really any occupation that you can look at short of being in the military that you can say that it is 100% that women's earnings as a percentage of men's would be 100%. So for example, if you wanted to take the top occupation with construction and extraction, 91.3% of what men earn. So again, for every dollar, a man earns, a woman would get 91 cents. <clears throat> Excuse me, if you look in the legal category at the very bottom, again, for every dollar the man earns, a woman's going to be earning 56 cents on that dollar. You know, you look at computer 
and mathematical in the middle. It's about 81 cents that a woman would earn for every dollar that a man earns. Healthcare, about 88 cents. So there's really none of these that you could say would be totally equivalent. Like I said, we'll touch on military in just a little bit and how that looks differently. But again, I would challenge you as you work with your military families, you may have both spouses in the military, but you may often just have one spouse in the military and then the other spouse is out in the private workforce. And that's where a lot of this tends to come into play. So this report from the US G Joint Economic Commission, it's Gender Pay Inequality Consequences for Women, Families and the Economy, does a really good job of highlighting a lot of this information and kind of providing some summary. So the top one really struck me. A woman working full time year round earns 10,800 less per year than a man based on median annual earnings. And that that could add up to nearly a half a million dollars over a career. And that's a lot of money, a half a million dollars. And you know, I would challenge you to think too what that equates to from a retirement standpoint as well. Because if they're earning that much less and we have these benefit packages with retirement, but again, are more often based on percentages of what we earn, then that's less money going into there. And then thinking about, you know, from a social security standpoint as well, what goes into social security is based on that. And what you draw is based on your earnings over your last 20 highest year earnings. So again, if women are earning less than men, that's hurting them from that whole retirement standpoint, from private retirement benefits with 401ks, 403bs, to the government social security retirement benefits as well. And then again, on the percentage base, women earn about 79%. And again, that's that gender earnings ratio. So thinking about, you know, women are paid less than $4 for every $5 paid to men. And then again, you know, how long it's going to take for it to close if we continue with that current rate being 2059. And thinking about, and we'll look at this as far as what that looks like in older ages as well, that women 75 years and older are almost twice as likely as men to live in poverty. And then we also have to think about, you know, where people reside in different states and stuff, because we do know that gender pay gap varies widely across states from a low of 10% in Washington, D.C. to a high of 35% in Louisiana. So, you know, thinking about the Louisiana example, you know, for every dollar, a woman's earning 65 cents. And then again, you know, it's lower at every level of education. And then oftentimes as women do the higher education, it's even less as far as the gap, as far as the earnings ratio, meaning like the 74 cents versus the 77 cents for high school graduates. And the typical woman with a graduate degree earns 5,000 less than the typical man with a bachelor's degree. So even having that master level, higher level degree, the woman earns less than a man with a lower level degree. And Russ notes, and they live longer. They most definitely do, women. So again, you know, thinking about that from that retirement perspective, the living longer means you need to have money to last you longer in retirement, which generally equates to having more money. And then as we saw in those charts too, it also varies based on race, based on ethnicity. So compared to white men, African-American women on average are paid only 60 cents on the dollar. And Latinas are paid about 55 cents on the dollar compared to white men. And again, that pay gap, it typically grows with age. So again, the older you get, the pay gap increases. So they give the example of women ages 18 to 24, earning 88% of their male counterparts, while over 35, 76%. And there are a lot of factors that contribute to this. Like I said, you gotta think about where people reside, you know, we've looked at different demographic factors. You're thinking about education as well. 
But what the commission says is even when all those factors are taken into account, as much as 40% of the pay gap could be contributed to um, discrimination. So even when all of that kind of stuff's taken into account, there's still a lot that could be attributed to discrimination. And what you'll see in just a few minutes too, is how much families really do depend on the women earning for the household and how much that truly does contribute to that. And then when we look at a lot of the economic growth in the recent decades, we do know that women's increased participation in the labor force has been a huge driver behind that. And the Council for Economic Advisors state that the US economy is two trillion bigger today than it would have been if women had not increased their participation an hour since 1970. So thinking about you know, what we can do to help with that gender pay gap, you know, thinking about what policies and stuff might need to be enacted to help decrease that income equality that would help to lift many women out of poverty, especially again, when you think about it across that life cycle and going into those retirement years. They're really, you know, thinking about it from the women perspective, they're not going in with the same foothold that a male would go in with. So when you look more at what causes that pay gap, again, it's much more complicated than just a single number because it really does summarize a huge diversity of women life circumstances. And it's also more complicated than just a single cause. So women and men have always participated in the workforce in different ways and have oftentimes been treated differently by employers. Those differences have shrunk quite a bit over time, but they do still today contribute to women being paid less than men. So one major cause of the gender pay gap is what researchers call occupational segregation. The tendency for men and women to work in different fields with different levels of compensation. And then another substantial cause of the gender pay gap is patterns of work. So the research tells us that women tend to work fewer hours and are more likely to take time away from the workforce to care for family members. And they're also more likely to need those flexible work schedules. In addition to those factors, again, a lot of that you saw on the prior slide, 40% or so, points to the impact of bias and discrimination on women's pay relative to that of men. So again, you know, thinking about occupational segregation feeds into it, work pattern does too, but even taking all of that and holding it constant, there still is a gender bias associated with a good chunk of the pay gap. So when you look at the choices of occupation and different patterns of work, again, that does account for the salaries and the differences, some of it, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So in 2015, despite making up almost half the workforce, women held only about 26% of private sector executive positions. With women of color particularly unlikely to hold such positions. So it's, you know, how do you know what discrimination is and what bias is as far as affecting the pay gap? So studies have found that as women enter industry, wages in that industry drop even for men, because discrimination cannot be directly detected in most of those records of income and employment, researchers often look for that unexplained pay gap after statistically accounting for a lot of the other factors that we talked about. So college major, for example, occupation, you're looking at work hours and time out of the workforce. So what they found was after accounting for the issues that were raised, the about 7% difference in the earnings of women and men one year after college graduation was still unexplained. And then other researchers have found similar unexplained variances. So it goes from about six to 12% is what they're saying within that of the unexplained pay gaps. And again, when you start to look at the family, and the effect that this has, because again, you've got this household 
we're definitely starting to see a lot more working mothers. So in fact, married where both parents were working about 66% of the households. And then single mother working 28% of households. And then married only for the mothers working about 6%. And they found that 34% of families with a mother working depend solely on the mother's wages. I can tell you, you know, speaking from my personal experience, I work full time and my husband stays home full time with our kids. We have a, two toddlers and he stays home full time and I am the bread earner, the person who brings in all of the income. So when you look at the contribution of women to family earnings, we see that it's really important for our lowest earners. So if you look to the far left, the bottom 20% of earners, so less than 21,600, women are making up the most of those earnings, 89%. And then as you get to the top family earnings, over 112,000 is how they broke it down women are still contributing almost 30% to that. You, know, you think about kind of middle income, the 41.5 to 68.7, it's 41% of the earnings. So I would also challenge you, you know, to think about how this could affect, you know, potential for buying a home, buying a vehicle. I often see families who um, they do everything based on having both of those incomes so what's going to happen to the family who's right here at the 50,000 mark and the woman's income makes up 41% and you know she has to take off to care give or something like that or even one of them loses a job you know it could go either way but when you're seeing incomes based on that high of a percentage and again if folks are using both the incomes to be able to attain a mortgage or a car or whatever they can be in a precarious situation if one does lose a job. So, you know, thinking about how we might, um, from a financial counseling perspective, advise families. Because you are seeing a lot of families who do get into that. We saw that with the um, recession and folks, you know, losing jobs and went on to lose homes. Not only did they have more of a home than they could afford, but they often did it based on both of those incomes. And then thinking about schedules and parenting. So again, women are more likely to leave the workforce or work part-time when they have young children. Many stay at home and part-time working mothers will eventually decide to return to the full-time workforce. But when they do, they may encounter what research has deemed the motherhood penalty. And that extends beyond the actual time out of the workforce. So meaning when they actually come back into the workforce, you know, that could extend on the job now as far as being paid less and stuff. <clears throat> so fathers, in contrast, do not suffer a penalty compared with other working men. Many fathers actually receive higher wages after having a child, and research has deemed that as the fatherhood bonus. So women, again, they oftentimes do tend to work fewer hours, but even when they work full time, you still see this discrepancies within that. So again, women have children. It's almost like the motherhood penalty. Men have children and they're more likely to actually get higher wages and even be seen better within the workforce is what research has told us. So this one is looking at the perspective of the different amounts of hours worked and then taking that significant amount of time off, whether they've actually quit a job or turned down a promotion to be able to um, take care of a child or of a family member. And pretty much across the board, you can see that the mother is more likely to do any four of those than the father. So the mother is more likely to reduce hours, to take a significant amount of time off, <clears throat> to quit a job, to turn down a promotion compared to the father. So again, you know, trying to come back into the workforce after some of that, you know, whether you're even just taking um, 
FMLA and you're supposed to be coming back, you know, it's the same title and same amount of money. It basically holds that job for you. It could still be viewed differently when you come back later down the road for promotions and raises and all of that. So the next one looks at median weekly earnings among men and women with and without children. So again, women are more likely to leave the workforce or work part-time when they have young children. We've discussed that. And then many stay-at-home and part-time working mothers will eventually decide to return full-time to the workforce. But again, we've got that motherhood penalty, calling it the mommy penalty in this one. So when you look at that and compare similar people in same jobs, all of that, and again, this is among full-time workers, and this specific one is 25 to 54 years of age for men and women, there's still a gap in the pay, so a 3% gap for women who have children versus those who don't, and you see the opposite effect for men, a 15% bonus for having kids compared to men who do not have children. I think you know, it's kind of interesting to look at those differences within that. And then how does that carry over into older adults? I touched on social security as we were going through some of that. But again, you've got the earnings that are feeding into the benefits, whether it's 401ks or whatever in social security, if you've got less earnings and the system is based on earnings, women are always gonna fare worse than men. So Social Security, older women, their benefits are typically going to be smaller than men's benefits. So again, you've got those earnings that are based on those individual earnings histories. Women have those lower earnings across the life cycle and oftentimes spend fewer years in the paid labor force. And as a result, it's estimated, the last numbers I can found, about 79% Social Security benefit for female retirees compared to what males draw. So again, for about every dollar a man earns, a woman's going to get 79 cents from a Social Security retirement benefit perspective. So I see Karen is saying a fatherhood bonus minus bias equals man needs more money to take care of his family. I think when you think about that, it's all tied up in a lot of that bias. And a lot of those kind of stereotypical beliefs that have kind of been passed down to generations and stuff. So. so this one looks at social security, looks at earnings and look at pensions. So different um, income received by older adults. And again, looking at those differences, you've got the men on the far left, 964 compared to 640 for the women. And this is looking at the year of 2014 and all of those totals received. So this is in the millions. You know, you look at the differences in social security, women 276 to 285 for men. Earnings, you see that really clear, 148 compared to 316 million. And then again, it makes sense that you would also see that within the pensions. So 100 million compared to 195 for men. So, you know, it makes sense that you've got less earnings across the life cycle, less time in the workforce, often more time out, that it's going to have this type of effect on gender at older ages. In fact, one of the um, biggest indicators of being poverty at older ages is to be a single woman. That's the biggest one, the biggest group that we see in poverty. And then you throw race and ethnicity into it and you'll see it across the board as well for women. So again, looking at those pensions, you know, women are less likely to men to get those traditional pensions. And again, you know, we see pensions going away, you know, even though within 401ks, 403bs, that standpoint, you know, women are still less likely to work in a more likely, sorry, to work in jobs that do not offer those retirement plans. So when you look at, you know, some of the pension ones on kind of that left side of the screen, 
you know, oftentimes to be eligible to be in a pension, you've got to work there for a certain number of years. So it doesn't necessarily favor entering the labor force and exiting to, you know, raise children up until, you know, say they could go to school or whatever the case may be, or to have to care gift for parents or in-laws. So that would be hard for somebody to oftentimes qualify even for a pension. You, know, you think about the other retirement plans, you know, you have to think about vesting and when is someone fully vested in it? You know, that could be from day one or it could be five years from now. And again, if you have individuals who are entering and leaving that workforce and then thinking too, you know, maybe they did work for a year. You know, we oftentimes see a lot of people who um, have smaller benefit amounts and they'll think it's not much. So they'll actually go ahead and cash those out versus rolling that on over into another plan that could, you know, continue to um, may not have more money going into it, but hopefully would keep churning and would have more money at the end in retirement years. So thinking again, how we offer that counseling advice from that more holistic approach and how all of that goes into that. And then, like I said, looking at the poverty rates. So this one looks at it among gender and compares men and women for older ages. So like I said, being that woman, single woman is gonna be a key risk factor for having poverty at older ages. And it's really a poverty factor regardless of age. So 65 and older compared to 75 and older. And then you've also got to think about we still see quite a few women who are marrying men who are older ages. So I'll give myself as an example again for that. My husband's 10 years older than me. We know women live longer than men. So if he's already 10 years older than me and we know that women live longer, I'm probably going to live longer than he is for sure. And that year gap may increase just based on what we know. So again, I may need more money in retirement for those longer years. So let's look at some of the information from the military perspective. So when you look at it from the military's perspective, you do see that service members typically earn more than civilians with comparable levels of education. So holding education constant, service members typically have higher earnings. And then they oftentimes receive benefits that civilians do not. So you might get like a housing allowance or subsidized childcare, tuition assistance, comprehensive health care, and have it at a much more reduced cost than, you know, from our civilians from that perspective. From 2000 to 2010, the average increase in regular compensation, and this is adjusted for inflation, was 40% for enlisted members and 25% for officers. If you compare that to the civilian over that same time period, again, inflation adjusted, the civilian pay fell by 4% and 8%. So the military earnings are at least heading in the right direction. But again, you know, thinking about it from that holistic family perspective, you may have one partner that is in the military why the other person is not, and they're out here dealing with that private sector. So again, as these folks are taking out loans for cars or whatever it is, are they doing that based on both incomes, one income? You know, thinking about how that feeds in to that situation. So we know that the military pay is based on tables for enlisted personnel and officers. It's going to be the same regardless of race and gender. So when you think about that from a women and from a minority perspective, the military pay is definitely going to look better relative to civilian pay. But when you start to see people exit from the military and they start looking at civilian jobs, the women minorities are likely to see their wages fall even more than what a white man would coming out of the same situation. And that could definitely change a family's economic circumstances. You know, if you're coming out and you're thinking you're gonna get a comparable job and you're like, okay, well, it'll be a little less because of this, but then you learn it's really gonna be 20 or 30% less, that definitely has implications and you likely still have loans that you're responsible for. 
And then looking at it again, looking at military spouses and just giving the example of wives. So compared to civilian wives with similar characteristics, military wives are less likely to work, more likely to be unemployed, typically fewer work weeks each year, fewer hours each week if they do work. Again, they're generally going to be paid less and they move more frequently. So it's kind of hard to build up unless you've got a company that is you know, in different states and cities that you can transfer to another position that's similar to yours. It's hard to build up that longevity with a company and it may be hard to get those promotions. And then military wives more likely to work part-time when they would prefer full-time work. And they're oftentimes more likely to be overeducated for the jobs that they do hold. Similarly, military husbands are more likely to be unemployed, earn less, and more of more frequently than civilian husbands. So again, you know, thinking about it from that holistic family perspective and what that means when you're trying to filter out financial decision making and you know, trying to set those goals for the future and how to get there and how to plan. So when you look at those spouse earnings, the annual earnings of female military spouses who are married to active duty service members and who worked in a given year are gonna be about 14% less when compared to civilian spouses that are you know, similarly educated in jobs and all of that. And when you think about it relative to deployment, we know that spouses are less likely to work when that service member's deployed. And in fact, not only are they less likely to work during that time period, but the research also showed that the spouse's participation in the labor force fell several months before deployment. I would anticipate probably planning for deployment and getting ready for that, maybe even possibly a move. And it wasn't until several months after that that they actually become employed again. Now, if they did continue to work during that deployment, they saw almost no change in wages and within hours. But we do see a good chunk that, um, again, will cut back on work, sometimes totally quit. And it's a while before that picks up again. So I am going to hand it over now to Barb, and she's going to talk with you more about what women and men need to know about money. Barb, I think you may need to unmute. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Can you double check and let me know? Loud and clear. <laughs> Loud and clear. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, what I'm going to do in the second half of the workshop is talk about some basic personal finance information, tips and advice that we might give clients, but kind of view it through the lens of uh, women in, in um, realization of everything that Marty just said about some of the gender differences with respect to personal finances. So the information that I'm sharing is available from a free online resource. It's a cooperative extension workbook called Money Talk. A financial guide for women and you can download it uh, from online and there are a lot of worksheets that are built into this uh, workbook that you might find of use to your clients so to get started um, this quote I love it and we actually have it in as a preface to the book and it's from Elizabeth Cady Stanton who was one of the first wave of women who tried to get women the right to vote. And it actually turned out that it was a generation later where that actually happened, but they were trying to do this back in the late 1800s. And she was talking about the fact that no matter how much women prefer to lean, be protected and supported, nor how, how much men prefer to have them do so, they must make the voyage of life alone. And for safety in an emergency, they must know something of the laws of navigation. So this quote really speaks to the need for financial self-sufficiency for women. 
And I've seen resources that have talked anywhere between 85 to 90% of women will be managing their finances alone at at least one point in their life. And it might be during a period of um, singlehood. It might be as a widow. There may be several times where women are going to be managing their finances alone. So let's just recap some of the research that um, Marty was just presenting. What are some of the financial challenges that women face? Some special, unique financial challenges compared to men. Let's just recap what the research told us. Um, so when you are dealing with women clients, what are some of the things that you're seeing as special challenges? So let's see if I can pull this down here. Um, okay, um, that's insecurity. Okay, so I'm seeing that. Um, are they smarter or they are smarter? Okay, that could be an interesting difference there. Um, I'm, I'm looking at information asymmetry, and that could be kind of interesting, um, particularly in the area of pay secrecy. Yeah, definitely. Uh, lower wages, fewer pensions, lower risk tolerance. Okay, so there are a number of things that are different. And let's just longer lifespans for sure. So let's just recap them. So we've learned that women live longer on average and earn less money on average. They're more likely to have gaps in their employment, and that's primarily due to um, caregiving, and it could be caregiving for a child, caregiving for um, an older parent, or caregiving for a spouse. Um, women tend to be more severely impacted by life events, so things such as divorce and widowhood, and again, that is often as a result of having less income to be left with because they're living on their own income at that point. Um, some women uh, lack financial experience. I think many years ago, we probably could have said many women. Uh, probably we, I would temper that and say some. And there's two other things that aren't listed on the slide that I think need to be acknowledged as well. And they're more um, characteristics, personal characteristics. Uh, one is negotiation skills. And we've kind of seen some chatter in that um, in the chat box related to salaries, particularly starting salaries. I can hold myself up as an example for that because I started my job at Rutgers uh, when I was 25 and I was very young and naive and I uh, didn't think much about negotiating. I was really just ha grateful to find a job after I got my master's degree. So that lack of negotiation skill can actually really hamper you if it goes throughout your entire career. I've been reading some articles recently that say that if you really want to get a good boost in pay, you'll probably need to leave your current employer and insist on a raise of at least 15 to 20 percent. Um, but again, women often have less experience with negotiating pay or negotiating even car prices for that matter, and that can be a detriment. And then another thing is that for some people, there still exists the old white knight syndrome where um, some women do expect men to kind of take care of things and then they don't take an active participation in their financial management. Okay, so let's just talk about some financial basics. And again, what we're going to do here is not so much cover the basics, because you already know these, but just kind of view them through the lens of a woman, given some of these unique challenges that we've just talked about. So a big one is managing household cash flow when you have a lower average income. And again, there's no rocket science to it. Uh, it's, it's simply... Um, increasing income, decreasing expenses, or doing a little bit of both. Those are really the only three legal and sustainable ways that you can improve your cash flow. And that becomes a real challenge when you have a lower average income, there's less margin for error because you're, you're really kind of crunched up to every little penny. It also can impact uh, investment decisions because if you're investing 
let's say $1,000 and it's your only $1,000, that's going to be a lot different than investing $1,000 when you have a lot more money um, in other places. So um, in some cases, it can kind of lead to a scarcity mentality or even just a fear mentality that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, and particularly when the income is volatile as well as low, that becomes a particular challenge because you can't even count on a regular paycheck. Okay, a little bit about insurance. And this is really just kind of a teaser for next month's uh, webinar where we're going to get into insurance in great depth. Um, some of you have probably seen this slide from the Garmin and Ford book that just talks about ways that people can manage risks in their life. So there's basically five ways. Um, do nothing and hope for the best. That's not really a strategy, but it's what some people do. Uh, you can avoid risks. You can reduce risks, you know, taking actions like wearing seatbelts, alarm systems, things of that sort. You can um, assume some risk as we do with our deductibles, um, and you can transfer risk through the purchase of insurance. So just some general tips, but again, think about somebody who's really kind of pressed to, um, to come up with the income to pay for premiums. You wanna put your dollars where they will do the most good, which means insuring for the major losses. So things that would really wipe a, a woman out completely, uh, things like liability, disability, having a major illness, so all those major losses. And of course, you want a highly rated insurance company, selecting the highest deductible that you can afford, because obviously, if you have a high deductible, you're going to need to have some emergency savings to back you up. You will save on premiums if you pay them less frequently, so either annually or semi-annually. Um, another issue that does come into play when there is a two paycheck family is just to make sure that you're not duplicating coverage and having to pay for that. Um, asking about available discounts, you know, just asking your insurance agent, are there any ways that I can save money? And it might involve bundling or it might involve choosing different options on various insurance policies. And then also um, just following the rule of three. Uh, checking out at least three different insurance companies for any type of coverage you might need. Okay, so life insurance. Let's think about that through the lens of a woman. Um, if she is a full-time homemaker, obviously she is um, going to be dependent on the income of her spouse, and should that spouse die, she's going to need to have insurance to protect against that. On the flip side, um, a woman may be a full-time homemaker, or in some cases, like Marty's husband, a man could be a full-time homemaker. And they're providing services that otherwise would have to be paid for. So you want to have kind of insurance on that as well. So factors to consider when people do a projection, and we'll get into this in a lot more detail next month in the insurance webinar. Things to consider would be the assets and debts that a couple has, um, the earning power of the surviving spouse, other sources of income and assets, and um, projected expenses. For example, do you also want to insure for a child's college education expenses? Okay, disability insurance. Women are affected in one unique way, of course, is obviously women are the only gender that can get pregnant and have children. So that could have some disability um, issues involved. Uh, also, men and women also have to look at issues related to disability that can halt their career. There's a lot of research out there, particularly the Retirement Confidence Survey, that indicates that people want to work longer, but sometimes they just can't, you know, either for health issues or layoffs or something. And it kind of truncates their career and they don't have as much time. Uh, so things that women particularly need to look at for disability would be um, how long a disability insurance policy lasts, because if you are going to work longer to try to make up some of that gap that we talked about before, um, you'll want to make sure that you have a policy that will cover you through maybe age 65, let's say, uh, so that your income 
uh, earning ability is protected basically up until the time that you can transition over to uh, some type of retirement pay. Uh, generally, you're only going to be able to cover about 60 to 70 percent of your gross earnings because obviously the insurance companies want to have you have an incentive to go back to work. And some key things to look at, and we'll flesh them out more next month, would be the de definition of disability, whether it's doing your own occupation or any occupation, and also the waiting period. So that would be the time from when you incur a disability to actually when you uh, collect your first check. Okay, let's talk about umbrella insurance. Now, why might this be something that women particularly might want to consider? Well, in many cases, women are going to be inheriting wealth because again, the li longer life expectancy. So there may come a period in some women's lives where they will inherit some wealth um, and perhaps have um, you know, the need to protect that wealth, you know, from lawsuits and things of that sort. So um, just making sure that you have the underlying coverage. So when you buy a million dollar life insurance policy, they will generally specify that you'll need to have, say, $300,000 of underlying auto and homeowners or renters insurance uh, liability. So you'll have to get it kind of all coordinated with one another. Women often tend to serve in um, community organizations. So another benefit of umbrella insurance is that it does provide uh, coverage for um, roles that you might have serving on the board of a nonprofit organization. And even some things like land, uh, libel and slander, there's coverage that goes well and beyond what you would typically have for your liability just on other policies. But again, you might want to check the exclusions that are involved and probably talk to your insurance agent because what many people will do is bundle um, their homeowners, their auto, and their umbrella insurance with one um, policy. And you often save on premiums that way. And then finally, uh, long-term care. I want to mention that because obviously women have an interest in this type of policy because of the longer life expectancies that we talked about before. Um, for women who don't have children, another thing to consider is that they're at higher risk of becoming what researchers are using the term elder orphans. And these would basically be um, people who are widowed or divorced and, and don't have any children and will be aging kind of solo agers is another name that they've given for this. And um, that too speaks to the need for uh, long-term care. So you've got the elder orphan risk for some women, you've got the longer life expectancy issues. Uh, long-term care can mean a wide range of services. Often we think of nursing homes, but it also includes um, home health care, assisted living, as well as nursing homes. And depending on the policy, you have to look at the policies and see what they cover, find out what the trigger points are, you know, how many activities of daily living does a person not be able to perform before the policy coverage can kick in if you have an insurance policy. But also think about other ways to handle the risk of long-term care costs. Um, some people will do what's called a self-insurance. They will retain that risk. Now you're gonna need to have a couple hundred thousand dollars, probably maybe even close to a half a million dollars, kind of in an account that's kind of earmarked for a possible long-term care insurance uh, care scenario. Obviously, if you're lucky and you dodge the bullet and you don't need to incur those costs, then it becomes part of perhaps a person's bequest that would go on to be transferred to their heirs when they pass. Uh, so you can self-insure for long-term costs. You can try to do everything human po humanly possible to take care of yourself. Um, there was just a great study that came out about a week ago that spoke to the um, impact of exercise, physical activity, 
as a way to lower the risk of dementia. So if, if you're if you're kind of scared of that, as I, I am, I, I spend an hour a day on treadmill um, getting those 10,000 steps. I was basically doing it just for all the physical benefits, but now that I, I know that it has some association with um, some issues related to dementia and later in life, all the more reason to take care of yourself. The problem is that you can do everything right, but there's no guarantee that you won't have a period of a need for long-term care in your lifetime. In fact, it, there have been some studies that have shown that people who do take care of themselves and do everything correctly, you know, they eat right, they get the physical activity, lower the stress levels, they actually could end up paying more in lifetime health costs than somebody who is a smoker and has obesity issues and doesn't take so much care of themselves. And part of it has to do with the, the costs that are incurred very late in life, which often includes long-term care. And then the third way, of course, is to transfer the risk of long-term care. And this is where people will buy long-term care insurance themselves or they might even have um, their adult children kick in toward the premiums. And some families will do that because in a sense, what the adult children are doing is um, helping to protect a possible inheritance that might otherwise get dissipated with long-term care costs. So that's an option for some people to consider. Um, as well. But again, a big uh, risk factor for women because of the uh, longevity issues that were discussed earlier. Okay, um, question for you. Any other important insurance tips that you would pass along to um, a female client, uh, either in a briefing, if you were doing a, a briefing with your your clients or a program, and again, briefing for our military people and programs uh, for our extension people. Uh, if you were doing some kind of public program uh, or you were in a counseling situation, would there be any other um, important insurance information that you might pass along to people? Just wanna make sure we don't miss anything. Okay, so Lindsay's saying shop around. Yeah, and again, that speaks to the rule of three and trying to get an apples to apples comparison uh, from three different providers. So if it was life insurance, obviously you'd be checking the same face amounts for three different um, issuers of life insurance. Yeah, and policy pitches from Russell. That's that's really important. You know, one thing I didn't mention there is um, we'll talk about that more next month is the whole issue of pension maximization and how they sometimes will try to pitch life insurance through that kind of mode. People need to be careful about that. That's mentioning consumer reports guide is a good go-to for sh to start shopping. Yeah, and the other thing I would recommend is your state insurance departments because insurance is generally regulated from a state level. So a lot of your state insurance departments will have information. Uh, Well-known doesn't mean a good product. Yeah, good point. You need to shop around. Um, yes, and, and Don, you've got an excellent point. I didn't really talk about auto insurance so much today because there weren't as many gender differences as some of the other policies. We'll get into this more next month, but obviously very true. The, the state minimums of liability limits on auto insurance in some states are really a joke, including my state here, and um, they're just inadequate. And you have to have a lot more liability insurance than what the minimum is for your state. Okay, so all great tips. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's move on and just talk a little bit about um, investments and how that might have some gender differences. So just to kind of set the stage, we all know that there are a number of risks that are involved with investments. We're gonna talk about risk tolerance in a minute. So that's why I wanna kind of introduce um, the concept of risk. So we have market risks. Security prices affected by the stock market. So market's been pretty volatile lately, up and down, up and down. You know, trade wars and political issues, all sorts of things can set off the stock market. And uh, interest rate risk, so that inverse relationship between uh, fixed income security prices like bonds and um, interest rates. And then inflation risk, 
if you're very conservative and you have a lot of money and cash assets, you might not lose any value per se, any principal, but you could be losing purchasing power. And then you have the business risk where maybe only one company or industry sector is affected by some event. Um, you know, think of the companies that have gone belly up, Enron and others that we can think of from past history. And then reinvestment risk is where you have to reinvest um, at a lower rate. So maybe you locked in a very long term CD rate that was very attractive and then you had to cash it in uh, when market rates were a lot lower. OK, so those are some of the major risks that we see as investors. And so the question is. Are women more conservative investors? You know, um, if you think about three different categories of investors, conservative, moderate, and aggressive, are, we more cons are women more conservative? You know, the research is kind of mixed on that. There have been studies that have said yes, but then there have been other studies that have said then when um, people, men or women, receive some financial education and um, kind of know more about investing. And also when they've had some life experience and realize that, you know, markets bounce back and, um, you know, downturns are temporary. When you have a little bit more of that perspective from either financial education or and or life experience, maybe not so much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through a couple of questions. And these are out of the Money Talk books. And you can download the worksheets off of the link that I provided with um, you before I started speaking. Uh, and take this yourself. And then I'm going to quiz you um, after we take this quiz and ask how you would categorize yourself, those of you that want to share. So you're a conservative investor if you want your money safe at all times, don't want to lose any of it. Any decline in the value would concern you. You're uncomfortable with price volatility. You want to minimize losses and fluctuation in the value of your investments. You would invest in something safe that offers a fixed rate of return. You're willing to give up higher rates of return to keep most of your principal intact. And you prefer investments that offer income opportunities without much exposure to principal loss. So these would be some characteristics of a conservative investor. OK, moderate. Um, mentally or even physically check off these boxes as I go through them. You're a moderate investor if you want your investment return to beat inflation by at least 2%, that you're in selecting investments that have a moderate amount of volatility, yet offer the opportunity to earn a higher rate of return than CDs or government bonds. Although a decline in the value of your investments is a concern, you can accept temporary market volatility in return for growth opportunities. So you're basically going to be riding it out. You would like to moderately increase the value of your investments with limited exposure to risk. And you want a balanced investment mix and are willing to tolerate some short-term fluctuation in value. So you can you can go to sleep at night if the um, Dow Jones goes down, you know, 500 points in a day as it has, you know, in some recent days. Okay, and then we'll go on to the aggressive investors. Uh, you're an aggressive investor if you like to pursue substantial appreciation opportunities, even though it puts your capital at risk. And the temporary market fluctuations do not concern you because your, your goal is maximum appreciation. You expect a greater return than the Standard & Poor's 500 index. And you're financially able to accept the lower liquidity in your investment portfolio. Because again, you probably aren't going to want to be cashing out during downturns. So you've got to have some other money somewhere that you might need for your liquidity needs. You've taken calculated risks to ensure potential for the highest return over time. And you have the conviction necessary to hold on to your investment during those years when it could drop in value by 25% or more. And this really isn't a hypothetical because we actually had a drop around 50% um, at the uh, end of the great recession 
in 2008, going into 2009 when it hit that um, low point in March of 2009. Okay, so hopefully you've been kind of checking the boxes mentally or um, just putting them on a um, piece of paper. So I'd be curious to ask um, you where you all fall. So if you want to share your risk tolerance, I, I agree with you, Norman. I too would classify myself as kind of a moderate investor. I definitely want to take some risk, but I'm not going to go for the most speculative investments or um, have a very, very large stock um, asset allocation. So we've got some aggressive people. We've got some moderate people. Okay. One thing you might be um, might be interesting when you're doing this uh, activity in a mixed group. I always kind of look for gender differences very often with my class at Rutgers. The males tend to be a little bit more aggressive with their um, investment risk tolerance than females. Although I have to say that even in the last few years, even some of the males uh, students in their 20s have been pretty conservative too. And I think some of that might just be having seen their parents go through the Great Recession. Um, so we've got a, more, a moderate boarding on aggressive. Okay, I love it. Um, so again, some of you might be on the cusp. Um, Beth's making a good point that um, age is a factor. And Sarah's making a great point too that you can have differences among couples where um, one spouse may be more conservative or aggressive than the other. Um, so again, um, something to think about. And this is just one of many risk tolerance tools. Um, another one that's out there was the one that we formerly had on Rutgers website that is now with the um, University of Missouri. And that's that um, investment risk tolerance quiz that was based on the research by Grable and Litton. Okay, let's move on and talk about investment choices. So this is kind of a graphic that comes out of the Money Talk book. So we've got this woman that's climbing the ladder and we've basically segregated investments into uh, four rungs. And this is not to say that people have to get up to the top rung, you know, because that's where you have your very aggressive um, investments, very similar to the format of the investment pyramid, if you've seen that in textbooks, where you have a much smaller top piece that is the graphic for your very high risk investments. So on ladder uh, rung number one, you'll see the different types of um, investments that would be in that situation. Many of them are more like cash equivalent assets. So you've got your savings accounts and your money markets and your CDs and your treasury securities and your um, double E and I um, US savings bonds. And then up to ladder rung two, you've got individual bonds that are rated uh, a or better. So we're basically talking about investment grade bonds in various types of categories. So you might have your municipal bonds and corporate bonds, those zero coupon bonds that you buy at a discount and have them um, grow to uh, full face value after a period of time. Your bond funds that consist of um, investment grade securities and your Ginny Mays, which are um, portfolios of mortgage backed securities. And then up to rung three, we're into equity territory here. So we've got um, we've got stocks and different types of stocks. We might have the um, established blue chip stocks, um, growth stocks, value stocks that are kind of selling uh, below their um, their book value, if you will. Uh, for some reason, they're temporarily uh, being discounted by the market and undervalued. And then you've got your stock mutual funds and variable annuities also fall into that category if people are choosing um, the sub accounts that are in um, equity portfolios. Um, when you buy a variable annuity, you get to choose um, where those dollars are allocated. And then up to the top of the rung, that's where we've got um, the highest risk of investments. So here we're talking about small company stocks and mutual funds that invest in those small companies. We're talking about um, sector funds, which tend to be higher risk because you're investing in one market sector only versus the diversification that you would get if 
it was a growth fund that was open to all industry sectors. So for example, you might just be in the healthcare sector or the technology sector. So less diversification, higher risk. Emerging markets, where you're investing in, com in countries that are obviously developing countries that could have all sorts of issues, currency issues, um, political stability issues. Again, you just have to know what you're getting into. Uh, gold and precious metals funds, penny stocks, which again, tend to be very speculative, uh, commodities, futures, you know, any of those types of things. And then international stocks and mutual funds often fall in this category too, because again, in addition to all the risks that you have inherent in any type of stock and mutual fund, you're dealing again with currency issues and overseas government issues, and it just adds um, a little bit more risk factor there. Um, okay, and I'm looking at Kent's comment, those who invest in target date or life cycle funds, um, yeah, you, you definitely there could be in different rung. You, you could, could have assets from different rungs, and again, you would be choosing um, or your fund would be choosing, you would be choosing the target date, and then the fund itself would be choosing the asset allocation for that target date. Uh, so that's an excellent point. So you can have um, a, one product either within your retirement plan, or you might have mutual funds um, outside and taxable accounts that could be um, a combination of the rungs. So good point. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. It could be a combination of them. So that's a good point. Um, okay, so let's just talk a little bit about investing for retirement as we kind of wrap up today. And not going to spend a lot of time on that. We've done a number of webinars on retirement, but I do want to share one thing that really, again, from the lens of gender and finance, and that's the rule of 72. And I'm sure you're all familiar with this. You teach this all the time. You write about it. And we know that it's just a simple shorthand way to figure out how long it takes or at what interest rate you need to double a sum of money. So if you're solving for the years, you divide the interest into 72. If you're solving for the uh, interest rate, you divide the years into 72. And then there's also the rule of um, 115, where you can get an approximation of how long it takes to triple your money. Um, in various interest rate and time scenarios. So what does this have to do with gender and finance? Well, again, if women do invest um, more conservatively, um, they have fewer doubling periods, you know, because again, you're looking at the time that it takes for money to double. If you're going to be at 4% interest, it's going to take 18 years to double a sum of money. If you're at 8 um, percent interest, as you can see on the slide, it's going to take nine years. So you're going to have a whole lot more doubling periods if you are um, a little bit more aggressive, can take those risks. If you can get to a moderate aggressive um, level and feel comfortable and sleep at night, you're going to have more doubling periods in your investment time horizon, which is basically your lifetime, than somebody who would have fewer doubling periods because they're getting a very low rate of return. And I always try this on my students at Rutgers, and we do, okay, what if you got 1% on your money? It's going to take you 72 years to double your money. And that really makes the, the point to them, because again, many of them did see their parents lose money in stocks. They tend to be a little gun shy. Um, but when they see that it's going to take them 72 years to double the sum of money um, at 1% interest, uh, I think it kind of makes the point for them. So that's why I wanted to kind of throw this in. Another thing that's in the book um, that I highly recommend you think about doing for yourselves and also share with clients is having an investment policy statement. Many organizations have them. For example, I'm treasurer now of double, AAFCS, uh, American Association of Family and Consumer Sciences. And one of the things that we did last year was we wrote an investment policy statement for the organization, stating how we wanted to have our endowed accounts 
um, invested and approximate asset allocations and timelines and that sort of thing. So what I've given you on the slide is just a personal investment policy statement. So you describe yourself as what type of investor you feel most comfortable investing in and you would list the products. Possible alternative investments could be, and again, you would list what might be an alternative. You feel you will be able to get a real after inflation return of X percent on your investments. And then there's a couple of um, questions there or lines to indicate what you would do to learn more about investments and to educate yourself about investing. And number seven has to do with your goal. By a certain year, you wanna have a certain dollar amount invested. And by the time you plan to retire, in X years, you want to have a certain amount accumulated. So again, it just kind of gives you um, an opportunity to kind of think through what your game plan is for investing. And also, um, IPSs can be very helpful when you're working with a financial advisor to kind of share your thinking about um, your investment portfolio. And again, if you can do a lot of these things ahead of time, um, you can be a more prepared customer uh, when you visit a financial advisor, just like you would often write down things when you visit your doctor. There's a whole section in, in the book that talks about future life events. So there's just a number of things that can affect women and men. But again, as I mentioned before, sometimes the financial impact is a little bit harsher on women than it is for men. So we've got life events like divorce and widowhood, marriage, remarriage, parenting, all sorts of things. And again, you can read um, the detail in the book. We have we don't have enough time to get into all of them today. Um, but I will give you some key takeaways. Um, first, from that uh, section of the book. First of all, the importance of preparing uh, legal documents. So having a will, um, a living will, and a power of attorney. And to do it, don't procrastinate. It's been interesting. I, I, some of you know I'm moving down to Florida, and a couple of times I've been down um, to the place where I'm going to live, and I've been kind of interviewing people just to get a sense of who they recommend for the professionals in Ocala, Florida. And invariably, I will ask about doctors and dentists, and people will reel off names, and then I'll say, okay, and how about an attorney? And people are silent, and they say, oh, we haven't gotten around to that yet. You know, that's really important. You need to take care of all the uh, legal documents, um, you know, as soon as possible. And especially if you're moving locations, um, make sure that they're compatible with your new state of residence. And I know that affects military people a lot. Make sure that your asset titles don't conflict with your will. Review your beneficiary designations. Uh, we have a worksheet on our uh, website at Rutgers Cooperative Extension that you can download and fill in for that purpose. And then another key takeaway is that a certainty of life is changed relationships. We don't know when and how they're going to change, but it is something that probably will happen. Take your time with major financial decisions. Divorce may require painful financial adjustments. For many people, it's going to be a scenario of living on less. And then the importance of using I messages to communicate about money. Uh, when you're in a relationship with another person and you're commingling your finances. So an example would be, I feel afraid when we charge more than $300 on a credit card, or I feel afraid when our savings balance goes below $1,000. So rather than accusing somebody of maxing out the credit card, you're talking about the feelings, and um, it's just a healthier way to communicate about finances. Okay, I see that my time is, is just about up and I am done. So at this point, I'm going to turn the webinar back to, uh, to Molly to close us out. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Gillen. This webinar is uh, worth 1.5 CEUs for AFCs and CPFCs. You can complete the evaluation through the link on the screen that I will also share in the chat pod and then be directed to a 10 question quiz. If you pass with 80% or higher, you will receive your certificate of completion that you can exchange for your CEUs. 
And we invite you to attend our webinar next month on June 18th. We can go ahead to that slide. Insurance principles and resources, what financial practitioners need to know is on June 18th. Dr. Barbara O'Neill will be presenting that session. I encourage you all to RSVP and join us on June 18th. And thank you so all so much for your comments and questions in the chat pod today. I'll turn things over to Coral. Thank you, Molly, so much. I wanted to echo Molly's thanks to Dr. O'Neill and Dr. Gillen for sharing their expertise today, as well as to everyone who contributed questions and many resources and wonderful comments in the chat pod. Uh, we will leave the room open for just another minute or two in case you need to collect any links from the chat pod. Uh, we have another minute or so, so if you are thinking of a pressing question, regarding today's topic, do feel free to type it in the chat pod. Otherwise, we wish you a wonderful day. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you again soon.